Okay, good good morning everyone. Um, and can I welcome members of the public uh, to the fourth meeting of 2019 of the Social Security Committee. Uh, we have had agenda item one already in, in, in private, so we'll shortly be moving to agenda item two. But in doing so, can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and other devices to silent mode so they don't disrupt the meeting. Uh, we've not had any apologies. We've got, uh, well, actually, uh, Mark Griffin, MSP, is hoping to be with us, but we've not done any apologies. Uh, so hopefully we'll have a full team here before the end of the session. Uh, and we will now move to agenda item two, which is decision on taking business in private. The committee is asked to agree that item five, a discussion on future work, is taken in private. Is the committee agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, we now turn to agenda item three, the draft social security charter. The committee will take evidence in the Scottish Government's draft social security charter. And can I welcome the cabinet secretary uh, for social security, Shirley Ann Somerville. Thank you very much for joining us th this morning. Sorry about the slight wait and, and, and getting to this point on the agenda. And can I also welcome the cabinet, uh, cabinet secretary's officials, Stephen O'Neill, social security policy team leader, Julie Guy, principal social researcher, both from Scottish Government, and Chris Boylan, Strategy, Public Policy and Corporate Assurance, Social Security, Scotland. Uh, thank you, all of you, uh, for coming here <coughs> this morning. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement, and then we'll move to some questions. Thank you, Gidvira, and good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to hear uh, the committee's views today on the Social Security Charter, a piece of work, I believe, that Scotland can be very proud of. The committee is aware that the Scottish Government is committed to a system on the recognition that social security is a human right, therefore all of us who need it. The Charter was always about bringing that commitment to life, identifying the specific things that the Scottish Government and Social Security Scotland must do to deliver a system that lived up to that aspiration. A system that translates the good intentions set out in the social security principles into real life improvements to people's everyday experiences. And who better to tell us how to do that than the people who know the system best, those with lived experience of it, who have relied on it and who understand the specific ways in which it must change. <clears throat> I'd want to reflect for a moment on the hard work and sacrifice of the people with lived experience who wrote this charter. It is no exaggeration to say that many of them have had experiences of the UK system that border on the inhumane. It took a great deal of courage and a deep personal commitment to build something better for them to place their trust in the Scottish Government. As one core group member put it in a powerful public statement, we all took a huge risk in taking part. Many of us have trauma responses to dealing with the DWP. For the first few sessions, we were afraid to talk about what we really needed because we were so used to anything we say being used against us. But people came out crying because it was the first time for many of us that we'd been believed and that people in authority were horrified at our experiences. They went on to say, we wrote it. Session after session, we'd see our words, our fears and our hopes take form. I can point to bits in the charter which were my words. I will never be able to describe how important it is to us to be listened to and to be respected and believed. So I want to place on record my thanks to the core group for that trust and for their bravery and commitment to working with us to make things better for their fellow citizens. It's also important to remember that the process of involving people with lived experience ran wider and deeper than the core group, pivotal though they were. Additional focus groups were run with refugees, asylum seekers, BME women, islanders, Social Security Scotland staff, a broad range of LGBT people and women who have experienced violence. This was supplemented with a series of individual interviews with people unable to travel and a survey of all 2,400 experienced panel members. It should be noted that participants from these sessions were added to the core group, which is important given its status as a key decision maker. The findings from these sessions are strongly reflected in the Charter before the Committee, not least in the many commitments relating to equality and diversity. <clears throat> it's also important to acknowledge the key role played by stakeholders. They consistently acted as a valued critical friend to the core group and to the Scottish Government, offering advice, support and constructive challenge to the core group and to ministers over a series of drafts. I'm pleased that stakeholders were able to engage so positively in what was a new and very different model of policy development. And a special thanks is due here to the Disability and Carers Benefit Expert Advisory Group, led by its Vice Chair, Dr Sally Witcher. 
From the very beginning, Dr Whitcher has been an instrumental in advising ministers and officials on effective co-design and later helped to shape the Charter to be as ambitious as it possibly could be. I know she believes in this Charter and she is very intent on holding ministers to account for delivering on it. This process has demonstrated the power of what can be achieved when the Scottish Government, Civic Scotland and people with lived experience work together in a spirit of true collaboration. The Charter they have created runs the full breadth of the new system, making commitments across four key themes. A people service is about establishing a positive relationship between staff and the people they serve. Notable commitments including kindness and empathy, warm referrals to other services to improve finances and well-being, values-based recruitment and involving people with lived experience of social security and staff training. Processes that work is about the design, accessibility and quality of the processes and systems that people will engage with when using the service. Notable commitments include adapting processes and communications to meet needs and preferences, delivery of services in local communities, inclusive communication and ongoing co-design with citizens. A learning system moves the Charter beyond delivery to address the culture and the values of Social Security Scotland, for example, that it encourages and values feedback, learns from it and strives to do better. Other notable commitments include involving those with lived experience in measuring performance and recruiting a diverse workforce. <clears throat> and a better future is about the Scottish Government's policy-making process and the wider exercise of devolved Social Security powers to improve people's lives. For example, through commitments to advancing a human rights-based approach, tackling stigma and using more positive language to describe social security and the people who access it. This is an ambitious and innovative document that sets a high bar for the Scottish Government and for Social Security Scotland. The committee will have noted that key stakeholders have universally welcomed the draft before it. As Professor Paul Spicker, a leading social security academic, said, there are a couple of days left to comment on the draft charter, but I'm not going to do that for the simple reason it's excellent and I have no criticism to make. Can anyone spot the difference with the DWP? Convener, I will close by placing on record my personal commitment to making sure that these standards are met, showing through the evidence of what we do that this government means what it says. This charter gives the Scottish Government and Social Security Scotland its marching orders. We understand in far more detail what the people of Scotland want and need from our new system. And it's my job to ensure that it is delivered in practice. This means new work in a whole range of areas, not least the development of a robust framework for measuring progress. Work on that framework is already underway, and I can confirm that it too will be co-designed with the people of Scotland and key stakeholders. As you would expect, Social Security Scotland's executive advisory body has been briefed extensively on the Charter and understands that it goes to the heart of the culture, values and behaviour of staff. Planning work has already commenced on embedding the Charter into operational practice, including through staff training and specific commitments, such as involving stakeholders and people with lived experience in that process. If parliamentary approval is granted, plans are also in place to immediately trigger work on making the Charter available in a range of accessible formats as quickly as possible. Similar work is taking place within the Scottish Government and we shall, of course, keep the committee updated with progress. Convener, I hope the committee will agree that this is an important and exciting milestone in our shared work to build a new system that truly delivers on our legislative principles. I know that many members of the committee have high ambitions for this Charter and made substantial contributions to defining its scope and purpose through the Bill process. It is my hope that this Charter makes good on those ambitions and that the committee will feel able to recommend that it be approved by Parliament. And I move the motion submitted in my name and be pleased to answer questions. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Let's listen to, uh, carefully to that. Um, personally, having read through the Charter, I, I find it very, very impressive as, as a draft document, uh, as you say, written by those with direct lived experience, uh, life at the coalface and li living on benefits or entitlements, which is, is a, hopefully a, a better word to use. In, in that context, uh, I'd like to put on record um, on the section a people service, which you referred to, Cabinet Secretary. Just even just the first three points, I want to make a, a, a wider point about this. Social Security of Scotland and the Scottish Government will one be patient, kind, and considerate, uh, and consider how you might feel. Two, listen to you, trust you, and treat you as an individual. And three, treat everyone equally, fairly, and without discrimination. I'm not going to read through the rest of those, 
but I just want the wider point there are some real high level aims in relation to getting it absolutely right every single time and the highest possible standard of service mm -hmm. to everyone that engages with Social Security Scotland. And that's as it should be uh, as, as, as the organisation um, really is just freshly established and, uh, and tries to progress. However, we don't always live in an ideal world. There are times where individuals, for whatever reason, get things wrong, they drop the ball. So for me, one of the most important things in this charter is not just that it was written by those with direct experience of the system, not just that the people service section uh, treats individuals with respect and dignity, but actually it's at page six where it says, and this is really where my question will come in, uh, can you tell us, uh, who can you tell if you think you do not think the char our charter is being met? Um, ask for feedback, suggestions and complaints. It actually encourages them and encourages people to call a free phone number in relation to that. It encourages individuals that have got issues with the policy or the level of entitlements um, to feed back in to the Scottish Government and Social Security Scotland over that. So I suppose my question, Cabinet Secretary, is it's a superb document. It raises expectations sky high, and that is a really positive thing. But the assurance I would want is that on the occasions where maybe we just don't get it perfect, because we live in the real world. Um, are you confident that the information within this charter in relation to how you feed in your concerns, mm -hmm. when we don't get it 100%, 100% of the time, will be suitable, flexible, responsive and meaningful for those who would engage with the, the service on that basis? Well, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right to point to the fact that um, we are raising the bar exceptionally high, and rightly so, for uh, the agency and for government on this. Much of this comes down to how the, the agency in particular will deal with um, feedback from individuals. Um, and there is obviously a process where people can feed that back directly. This is much improved on what people will have experienced um, at the present time because we are encouraging people to give uh, not just complaints but suggestions and, um, and, and feedback on the service on general as well. And for the staff member who receives that to be able to have um, the, the culture and the structure within the agency to be able to take that on board um, and see what can be done with that themselves. So there is an empowering of staff to act upon um, suggestions, comments, complaints um, from the very small to the perhaps um, large. There is obviously then the ability um, for individuals to go through the more official process within the agency if um, they're not happy and then to go to the um, ombudsman um, should they wish to do so. So I think what we're determined to do as we go through this is to ensure that the staff are empowered to be able to, um, to have that relationship with people when they're on the phone or meeting them face to face. Um, and that also that individuals feel um, comfortable with giving that information over to our agency because many currently don't with the system at present and because of the way that the, the agency designs the suggestions and complaints handling process, um, people can feel much more at ease about giving information um, over to the agency. So there's a great deal that, that goes on at, at that level to ensure that we're picking up on um, everything that happens. Um, obviously, everyone who has um, an interaction with the agency can also give their feedback on how they felt. So we're already building up information um, about how they felt that service has been for them and, and creating that, that feedback mechanism. And we'll develop that on, on ongoing. OK, and reporting on... I mean, this sounds like a, a strange conversation to be having, given what I've said about how positive the Charter is. But it's one of those things where actually there could be 300 complaints, but they could be positive things because the Charter and Social Security Scotland are asking people to feed in where they would like to see service improvement. So you look at a raw figure and you go, oh, look at all those complaints, but there's a Charter there. But actually, what, what, what's been aimed at is constructive uh, suggestions <coughs> for when 
we don't meet, the, meet the, the high standards that we're setting for Social Security Scotland. So how will that be monitored? Well, I think that is, uh, again, an important point. And it's a discussion I've had when I've met that team over um, in Glasgow, where we are encouraging people to come forward with things because feedback is, is a good thing. Um, and the fact that people are given feedback or have made a complaint about a service um, means that they're interacting with the service and getting us the information that we require to make things better. So there needs to be a culture within the agency of encouraging that type of, of feedback from people because it's the only way that we're going to, to learn. And I think that can be challenging sometimes. I can imagine um, that the committee and parliament will quite rightly want to scrutinise <coughs> the feedback that we're getting and complete numbers. But then there's the mature discussion about what types of feedback we're getting and then how the agency has dealt with that um, as well, which is the very important aspect about have we learned and have we been open to, to change. Um, so this is a, a new process, but it has to be one where we're encouraging people if they aren't happy with the service. Now, I should say that the initial feedback from um, 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 internal work that we've done within the agency has shown that people are exceptionally happy with uh, the, the level of service and the way that they've been treated and uh, their engagement with the agency. But every single one of the, the feedback mechanisms that's been used has been very seriously looked at to see what else we can improve on, even at this very early stage. Very helpful um, and quite a significant culture change from what has went before and totally non-defensive. Non so I'd, I'd like to put that on the record. Our Deputy Convener wants to follow up on some of that. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, yeah, I think it goes without saying that it's something exciting for this Parliament to develop something completely different. So um, that's accepted. I have three points to make. Um, the first is, um, when you say who created our charter, I thought there should be the inclusion of the Scottish Parliament Social Security Committee seems to be missing, or even the Parliament, because, as you know, the Parliament at least will confirm the, the Social Security Charter. Um, my second question relates to... So, uh, broadly speaking, I think that the, t the, the tone of it is, is absolutely right, and the language of respect. Um, I think it's important that the, the Charter also conveys information as much as it can. Under processes that work um, and under Part A, explain how you can appeal if you don't think the right decision has been made after a redetermination. Now, I think this is a very significant aspect of the Bill Act, should I say, <laughs> um, one which I took an interest in and I had some amendments that weren't accepted about the appeals process. Now, one of the things, um, Chris will confirm this, that um, one of the things that we settled on is that after a redetermination, if you appeal, and I think this is really important, the paperwork, although it would be a fresh redetermination, the paperwork uh, will, will work its way to the appeal tribe. And, and there's a very important concession made by the Scottish Government on this. And I feel quite strongly that it should be conveyed to people. You may argue that it's not appropriate to put it in the Charter, but I'd ask you to consider how it could be expanded to convey that information, because I think knowing that, I think, um, will, I think, uh, allow people to think that the process is not a simple one, but a more straightforward one. It, just lastly, on the question of language, so there's been a bit of exchange with Mark Giffen, my colleague, parliamentary questions about the use of the term benefits versus the use of the term entitlements. So I know you've changed your view on that based on what you've heard. I just wanted to ask, are you absolutely certain that in changing the language and in Social Security that benefits is the one that you want to settle on rather than entitlements? Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'll, I'll try and deal with um, each of these in term. I, I should point out that when I got this document up from the final uh, core group discussions and stakeholders, um, I didn't change a word of it. So the, what's in the different sections is what came from the core group and stakeholders. So it's, it's certainly, um, please, not a slight on the committee that, that they have not been um, mentioned um, in that. Um, I recognise my opening statements, the, the enormous work that went on in the bill process to make this um, something that will, I, I, I think the committee and parliament can be very um, proud of. 
so the reason it, it wasn't in there is because that didn't come through the, the process um, with, with the core group um, themselves and with stakeholders. In terms of the, the redetermination point, I suppose it is that challenge of what do you put in the charter and what do you put elsewhere? Um, and there was um, a, a great deal of discussion about this um, within the core group and stakeholders about what could go in here and what is elsewhere, because this shouldn't be seen as having to contain everything, but it needs to be able to contain the core information that people want. So I, I can certainly give reassurances that when um, people are receiving decision letters, for example, they're getting very clear information about redetermination and the agency's role within that. Um, and we'd be happy to provide some examples of, of how that happens on an operational basis, um, um, if, if that would help the committee get more reassurance on that. So I suppose in all of this, in all of these aspects, you could look at it and think we could have added another subclause. we could have added more detail in here. And the challenge was to keep it tight, to keep it as simple as possible, but contain all the information that we possibly needed to in, in a very complex um, system. But um, as I say, hopefully we can provide reassurance um, on what we are doing to, to be able to, to give people further information um, and stakeholders further information on the redetermined process. And the issue of languages is, is such an important one as we go th through this. And it, again, I suppose, um, touches on this um, aspect that's in the Charter around uh, tackling stigma uh, within benefits as well. And I do use the word benefits because it came back from um, work that we've done with experience panels about it is the most understood. Um, it is the aspect where what that people use themselves um, and there's a challenge for us, I suppose, to turn this around and ensure that we are tackling the stigma about being on a social security benefit, rather than trying to um, use words that the people weren't using themselves to explain their current situation. So I suppose it's a different way of tackling it. Um, yes, um, that we did consider and have obviously considered the use of the word entitlements more, it's simply not what people use themselves. And I think that's the kind of um, issue about going forward is about why were we looking to change it? And if it's because there's a negative attachment to that, then we should challenge that negative attachment rather than having another word for that. But I do take the point that the language is exceptionally important on this aspect. Thank you very much. Okay. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and uh, thank you for coming. And obviously, um, I agree with some of uh, what the Deputy Convener and Convener have said. Um, I, I suppose, and I should just say at the start, uh, for the transparency, that I am uh, in receipt of PIP and look forward to working with the new agency in due course. I mean, I think your, your, your final comment is absolutely right, that words do matter. And um, I suppose I would just like to explore a few of the comments in this, just to see what we actually mean. But I suppose my overriding point is, and, and Maybe you could expand slightly more. I think you said towards the end of your opening statement about a framework of how this is going to be measured. Because I suppose that, for me, as I read the document, was the issue that was missing here. So we have a commitment, which I think is a really welcome commitment, that a number of people that work for the new agency will have lived experience of disability of other areas. But there's no clear definition of, what, of how many. So is that, you know, did the agency tick a box if you have one person? You know, and I suppose that's the thing we'd like to measure. So I suppose, how do we measure this in regard to the commitments you made? If I can just go down to two, uh, two specifics, just to kind of, again, explore a wee bit in regard to the one. On page 10 of the draft charter, paragraph 12, it says, make sure face-to-face -face assessments are carried out by qualified staff who understand your condition and the impact it is having on you. Now, you read that and think, absolutely, that sounds really something we would all want to sign up to. But, I, you know, if I can just... I, I don't think you, with due respect, or anyone in this room, knows the impact of my disability has. Probably only my family have that. And I, I just think, what does that actually mean to a claimant because I can go in and have my assessment. That, whoever it is, however well trained we are, however qualified we are, 
They don't know what it means when I go home or when I get up in the morning, what my disability means. And I just mean, I, I think the danger is, and I think the community is right, we've set a very high standard here, and, and I totally applaud that. But I just wonder, what does it actually mean to me? So if I have to go for a reassessment at some point in the next few years, how do they know the impact it's having on me? So I'm not trying to be nitpicky, but I'm just trying to whether I... And I suppose the other issue is on page six. Again, it's just an example what you can tell us if you don't think our charter is set, being met. The final paragraph, you can complain about matters relating to policy discussions direct to Scottish government ministers. Um, you know, absolutely great thing, level of payment, eligibility rules. But again, you know, let's just say I don't think the eligibility rules are right. And I take the time and effort, perhaps quite difficult to try to put that down in an email. Practically, what does that mean? You know, Scottish Government, Scottish Parliament is not suddenly going to change their policy. Again, I, mean, I just wonder what is the expectation somebody should have if they take the time to set these emails? Because I think, you know, you've been quite critical of DWP. I'm not sure I totally <laughs> agree with everything you've said. But the DWP have a charter. You know, it's out there. It, it's something that, they, that people sign up to. Now, you would maybe want to argue that that charter hasn't been followed through on. I suppose my concern is if we raise these expectations, but I don't feel they've been met. There's a, there's a danger that people become disillusioned again. It's just another document. So that's very long, waffly, but hopefully you can pick something out of it. I, I shall endeavour um, to do so. I mean, you, you're absolutely <laughs> right. We are raising expectations and, you know, um, the committee and, and others will be aware of other charters that are out there for public agencies um, that, that haven't met expectations or have been quickly forgotten about. I think this one is different because of the work that the committee and parliament put into the bill process, now the Act, um, that ensures that, um, that ministers will report to, to parliament on what's happening with this, uh, that the commission, the new commission, will, will report on, on to, 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 to parliament um, and that that can be fed in. The measurement framework is at a very early stage, and I'd be obviously happy to, to um, uh, keep the committee up to date with that as it, as it goes on. As I, I touched on in my opening um, remarks, it will be um, built with people with lived experience of the social security system as well, including, for example, people from the initial core group um, to, to keep some of that continuity um, going on it as, as well. So we need to be able to measure people's experiences how efficient and effective the, the, the systems are. Um, and that will be um, a process that will be ongoing um, because we'll be working with the core group again. It's not just coming, it's come, something coming directly from, from government um, on that aspect. Um, there is obviously, as uh, I think I mentioned earlier, um, performance measurement work already being undertaken by Social Security Scotland uh, to ensure that we're gathering information about the interactions as possible. Um, so that is um, ongoing um, with that, and hopefully that gives a flavour of what's in the, the measurement um, framework. More details aren't included in the charter yet because we will be developing them with uh, members of the core group and, and others. Um, absolutely take your point about you know what is a qualified staff and I suppose it's taking that part of the charter and also seeing what's in the rest of the charter because obviously we are um, <clears throat> currently uh, consulting on what suitably qualified means as def uh, defined in the Act and the Expert Advisory Group is, is looking at that. Um, the other aspect though, where it does touch on the rest of the charter is about the culture. So rather than simply looking at perhaps what's on the form and in a particular um, line of, of somebody's application, it's about looking at um, the, the, an individual in the holistic sense and about trying to ensure that they are <clears throat> being encouraged to give information um, not just from medical professionals, but that could be from a family, it could be from carers, for, for example. So how are we gathering that information? Who are we gathering it from? 
But I think this is one of the aspects that we'll need to look very seriously at when we, we, when we move forward with the consultation on disability, because how can someone have faith when they're dealing with the agency that you really get it? Now, much of that, again, to touch on another part of the, training, uh, part of the charter, is around training, so ensuring that the staff have been um, on training that's actually been delivered by um, third sector um, agencies um, representing those with lived experience. That's already going on within the agency. Um, so it's about ensuring that the staff are as knowledgeable as they possibly can be. Um, but I totally take your point. We're, we're raising the bar very high. Complaints to Scottish Government ministers. Um, will be taken um, very seriously if, and, and it builds into the policy making section of, of the, the charter I suppose because you're looking at how we continue to make policy and it's about making policy um, with people with lived experience rather than for them and the issues that we've already been dealing with when we've been developing policy to date um, have very much been with people with lived experience. So whether it's complaints, whether it's feedback, whether it's positive comments, all of that will have to feed into our policy making and we will have to be able to demonstrate that through the measurement, um, the measuring framework that we've actually achieved that and, and done that. Will every complaint be listened to and, and um, lead to a change? Uh, no, um, that's clearly not possible. But we have to demonstrate that it's fed into that policy making loop uh, to be able to ensure that people can have faith that they should and, and most definitely can um, put in those types of, of, of complaints and feedback to, to ministers. Okay. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Keith Brown, MSP. Um, thanks very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. A couple of quick comments on points made already in the question. Um, on the last point raised by Jeremy Balfour, the idea of um, having, I think, what essentially is a Rolls-Royce system whereby somebody's particular circumstances are fully understood by the person they're talking to, I would fully support that and I welcome the comments that you've made. I would hope that everybody realises that it's a resource-intensive element of the system and it has to be funded. I think it's really important that we don't try and shoot for the moon and not provide the funding that's necessary. Separately, on the point that um, Polly McNeill had made previously, I do have an issue, well, a concern about the benefits entitlements language. I understand the point that you make and it can become a bit Orwellian to try and change a word, to try and change attitudes. I understand that. But it relates to the, the question I have, which is um, you mentioned that this charter gives you your standing orders. And you also mentioned um, the different focus groups who were listed uh, also in the forward to the charter as having been consulted. Uh, one of the groups not consulted, as best I can see at least, uh, were veterans. And I just wondered, veterans are a group who, and as far as you can generalise, and you can't really always do that, would find it difficult engaging with the system. Uh, and you mentioned some... Uh, a very affecting experience of those involved in the uh, core group who said that their experience of the DWP had been really bad and to actually see their concerns you know, aired in public and listened to was, was very gratifying. Certainly my experience at my surgeries is veterans uh, have had appalling experiences with universal credit and with the DWP. And I just wonder how you would look to take forward um, or measure the impact um, on veterans of the Charter as uh, things move forward? You raise a very important point and I'll perhaps bring in my colleagues on this because quite rightly um, I wasn't involved in the core group or in the research um, because that wouldn't be appropriate for ministers so I'll perhaps bring in others to say a little bit about um, their much closer involvement, but um, I can say that it's it's an area where um, the agencies already um, has contact with veterans charities um, at an operational level and, and has um, ensured that those contacts have been made. So as part of the wider stakeholder engagement of the agency, um, I know that um, they are already um, reaching out and having discussions with veterans charities. Um, but I don't know if... Um, do you want to kind of save something on that? Certainly. Um, I think Mr Brown's right to say that, that I don't think the 
people with lived experience that we engaged with included um, any veterans, and that was one of, of a couple of gaps that, that remained. Um, so, for example, gypsy travellers, we found very, very difficult to get into those communities. So, what I would say is that we have a short list in terms of when we go to deliver the measurement framework um, and how we're going to be taking forward staff training. And obviously, there's a, a whole lot in the charter about understanding the backgrounds that people come from and the impact that that has on them, as you've described with veterans. So, um, the veterans are absolutely one of the group, uh, one of a number of groups that we want to go out and do more engagement with as we start to look at the measurement framework, which gives us the opportunity to start to break down um, different types of people's experiences of the new system and to understand how things can work differently for those different types of people and whether approaches should be adapted. But I think the, the overarching point that, that you make is, is right. Um, that was one, one, one of the gaps was veterans. Um, I don't know if Julie could maybe say something about the framework. Yes, sure. Um, so yes, when we go to the framework, the um, yeah, t talking about veterans, the, the, there, there were one or two veterans that, that were in the wider focus groups. It's impossible for us to report on them because we will, uh, and exactly which focus groups they were in, because that we might identify them, which is not uh, allowed under the GDPR and also on research ethics. Um, going forward, um, we um, are using the wider experience panels um, to look at the ex uh, experience of people um, <coughs> With, with, with that there are veterans um, on the experience panels. Um, where, as we move towards more and more uh, benefits being delivered by the agency, the experience panels will turn into a client's insights regime where we will be asking people, every, uh, all people, what their experience of the system is and why it was good, why it was bad, and feeding that back. The other thing w is that we do break down who we are getting the information from. And veterans is one of the, the, the characteristics that we look for in people. The, the numbers are small, so we can't report them as a, uh, anything under 10, we can't report the number, but be assured that it's on our radar and, and that within the experience panels, we do have veterans. Very quickly, could you just a, a comment to say that, um, I think if I understand Mr O'Neill's response right, there will be some future measurement, I'm not sure, but I just think my view would be it would be a mistake not to be able to quantify over time the impact it's had specifically on veterans as veterans. And going to the point about very small samples, very often veterans don't identify as veterans, which provides more problems, I understand, but I do think it would be very useful over time, and I'm pretty sure that government will be asked this over time as well, what has been the impact on veterans, that was all. Yeah. Up on that, I mean, this is uh, an area where we're very keen to to to, to develop this process because this has been an exceptionally innovative way of developing policy, which is why, as well as the core group, um, when um, gaps were identified, further focus work was done, further focus group work um, was done. So, absolutely, take on board um, your point on that. It is difficult. Um, particularly challenging if people don't identify them themselves um, in that way uh, coming forward. But then that's our responsibility to try and make sure there's a system in place um, to, to either encourage that or to ensure that we're, we're, we're dealing with that challenge in, in a different way. But again, this goes down to the fact that, that we are open to, to learning um, as, as we go forward. And there, if there have been areas where people think we need to improve, we'll try to do that through the measuring framework or we'll try to do that continuously through the agency as well. Okay. Julie Guy, did you want to add anything before we move on? Yes, I do, um, the, the point about people not identifying as veterans is a good one because that we, may, um, we, we found out inadvertently that people who were uh, giving us, um, uh, working with us were veterans rather than um, uh, recruiting them as veterans. Um, so yeah, it, that was a learning point for us and veterans is, is certainly one of the groups that we've got on our um, list of people that is, it's important that we get, engage with specifically as and with them being identified as veterans. Okay, Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning. I was really pleased to see a, a reference to not conducting face-to-face -face disability benefit assessments um, where information needed to judge eligibility already exists. Um, and can I just ask for a bit more detail on that? How will the system judge what information will be necessary um, and how will this be communicated to the applicant? 
well, the details of that will be um, part of the, the disability consultations that will, will move um, forward as, as we move to the next benefits. It, it is really important when we're looking at how we develop the, the system for decision making around disability benefits, that we look at every single stage in that process to ensure we get to the point that there will be face-to-face -face assessments only if there's no other way of gathering information. So have we got the application form simple, um, a, but very effective? Um, the decision-making process that goes on behind that around um, you know, the guidance that's in front of a decision-maker, for example. So we will be taking um, a great deal of, of evidence and, and a great deal of consultation as we move forward to actually what that will mean in practice. Because to get to the point where we succeed in that one line in the Charter, there's a myriad of different steps that have to be in place to make sure that that happens. So the, the, the details of that will, will obviously come through in the consultation, but it is very important that the regulations, therefore, that we consult on, uh, or the policy, that we, and then the regulations, and also the, the, the guidelines which decision makers will have, have everything that they need to ensure decisions can be taken without a face-to-face -face assessment, if at all possible. And that will be through the gathering of information that's already available. Um, the Social Security Scotland Act uh, specifies groups that must be consulted in the production of the Charter. And among other groups, the Act requires that consultation of DLA and PIP recipients um, should take place. Can I ask for a bit more information on, on that? How was that conducted? And, you know, in particular, how many how many DLA and PIP recipients did take part? Well, I can provide the, the information to committee about the specifics um, as much as we can break down. Um, as uh, Julie has already mentioned, some of the aspects we can't break down um, because it may identify a person. Uh, but we did look very um, seriously at the core group to ensure that there was... Um, individuals on that that had experience of the different benefits um, that had both um, um, uh, a physical disability and uh, mental health um, and also um, areas where they had um, a condition that may be changeable over time and, and basically in many of the the types of um, people they, uh, who feel that the current system doesn't work for them. So we try to look very, very carefully at uh, not just um, age, um, sex, and um, the different demographics of people within the group, but also their lived experience of the system as well. But I can provide the, the, the further breakdown on that um, um, to the committee. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Alistair Allen. Thank you, convener. Um, Citizens' advice have certainly been uh, very welcoming of the, the launch of the, the strategy, but you've indicated, or the charter rather, but you, you've indicated you, you want to be able to measure progress. And I just wondered if you can say a little bit more about what that progress would, would look like, uh, or how rather successive it would be measured. Um, well, this is something which um, is in many ways not for me to decide, but um, we're handing that process over to. Um, those with lived experience to decide how they want to measure. Now, obviously, that will be done with a great deal of facilitation and um, support, as we just as we did when we developed um, the charter. Um, but you know, as, as I think I said earlier on, the early plans are to um, have, in many ways, a kind of larger core group that will look at that measurement, um, have a lot of capacity building for them, um, and it will look at the different areas of the Charter. Now, some of the, the, the aspects in the Charter might seem on face value quite difficult to, to measure, um, but that's the challenge that we have to, to overcome, is, is how that is done and how people will, will feel on that. Um, Julie will also be leading on the work with the framework, so I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about sure. where we're at with it at the moment. Sure. Um, yes, so the, the first step is going to be to put together a larger new group. Um, we're going to take some expertise from the, the core group that worked with us to um, design the charter, and we're going to also bring some new people in um, uh, <clears throat> to, to, to boost up the, the core group. And the, that will start with capacity building, as it did with the, the co-designing the charter, and then we will 
um, developer framework um, that is a robust uh, system of monitoring um, how both Secure Social Security Scotland and the Scottish Government are living up to the commitments in the, t in the Charter across all its four themes, which is really important. Uh, we'll be measuring people's experience, how effective and efficient the processes are, the culture of learning in the system, um, and how policy development is being progressed consistently with the Charter. Um, <clears throat> I also c can add that in terms of the... the uh, people who are we, we're engaging with, every single one of them has uh, experience of uh, one of the benefits that are going to be devolved to Scotland, and most of them have experience of DLA or PIP. What I'm driving at um, related to that is, is how, as a, as a government, as a minister, at the end of that process, would you know whether it had been a success or a failure? Well, I think that um, will also tie into the other work that goes on out with the measurement framework where we have um, the agency with their um, interim corporate plan at the moment, which will go out to, to consultation um, and um, that will be published this year. Um, so there will be a variety of ways within that that we're already looking at key performance indicators for the types of work that the, the agency is doing. In terms of government, that's where it comes down to um, can we demonstrate that we've done every single part of that charter um, that's delivered. Now, obviously, that won't be shown up in the agency's corporate plans, um, but that will be shown up in our um, report back to Parliament on how we've delivered um, on, on the charter on that. That extension of the core group seems like an excellent opportunity in relation to Keith Brown's point, in relation to veterans. That's not for, for answering it. So I'd state an obvious, Mr Brown, but just you explored a line of questioning there. Now, Shona, is it a supplementary you had? Because I've got Michelle Ballantyne for a new line of questioning. Was it a supplementary Not really, I'll wait. No. Okay, Michelle Ballantyne. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, a couple of things, you know, picking up from what uh, my colleague Jeremy was saying earlier, obviously there's, there's a lot in here um, and a, a lot of good promises, um, but... <coughs> Some of them I wonder how you're going to deliver. I mean, if I take number six on processes that work, um, you're offering face-to-face -face services in local communities and places that are convenient and accessible, including home visits if appropriate. So I certainly, you know, representing rural communities will be very interested to see how that operates because, it, you know, it's one of the big things for many of my constituents that it's difficult to get the things. Um, so I think they'll be delighted to hear that you're going to be actually in their local communities, but I, I do think it's going to be a big ask. Um, and I wonder if you're going to have to define these, some of these things a bit more tightly as time goes on. Um, the one thing that I, I leapt out at me, and, and uh, you may want to correct me if it's buried somewhere and I just haven't seen it, is there is no mention of data handling or information management anywhere in this charter. You know, in, in an age where obviously people raise a lot of concerns about how you're going to use their information and what you're going to do with their data in terms of protecting that doesn't seem to be anywhere in the charter at all. So that's my second point. And the third one is, is really, um, for my own understanding, and, and to ask the Cabinet Secretary, what is your understanding of the legal standing of this charter? So in terms of local delivery, um, there is obviously a key uh, difference in the way that Social Security Scotland will be developed because we are very keen to have a uh, face-to-face local delivery um, and that includes obviously in our rural, remote and island areas. Um, it is very important to, um, to think about how that will be done and it's not going to be, you know, an office in a local authority that will be the Social Security Scotland office that you have to come to, which is obviously exceptionally uh, difficult, particularly in um, rural areas. Um, so the local delivery will be done through, for example, um, um, co-location with um, other agencies, if that fits with the culture and values of Social Security Scotland um, and it will be done in areas, for example, in community settings, be that uh, libraries, community centres um, and, and so on. So it will be done in a very, very different um, way to what people will experienced um, before. 
Um, the data handling, obviously, we are um, govern governed by uh, the GDPR, and um, there will be further details available within Social Security Scotland's corporate planning, for example, around how that's dealt with. So um, it may not be um, a, a line in the charter, but there is um, absolutely um, a, a key focus um, on that. Indeed, I um, spoke with colleagues um, from the agency, from that team, when I was up in Dundee last week to discuss uh, data handling and uh, GDPR in particular. Um, and that's an area which um, the, the governance uh, section of the agency is, is, of course, taken very seriously and doing a great deal of work on and will be available in um, the different corporate planning aspects of it. Um, the charter um, is obviously has to be approved by Parliament um, and that will be a process, I suppose, that we are going through at the moment if the committee um, you know, um, wants to... Um, wants this to be passed or, or, or not, and then it will go to the, the Parliament to decide that. Um, we then obviously have the Commission who will look at the regis from a, um, from a systemic point of view to, to be able to address areas where uh, they feel that the government isn't living up to um, our obligations either within the Charter or the Act and report that to Parliament. Right, so your understanding of its legal standing? Well, I thought I had just described that. No, I'm not sure if you're trying to get at something in particular, I'm not no, sure. No, but no. It's your answer was the process by which it signed off. But once it's signed <coughs> off, what is its legal standing? Um, I think that the, the, the situation with regard to the legal status of the Charter was, was settled during the, the bill process. So the, the committee might recall... Um, Amendments laid by, I think, Mr. Tompkins. Yeah, I wasn't um, on the committee then. Oh, of course, apologies. Um, th there were amendments laid to the Social Security S Scotland Act as it is now that talk about the, the, the legal effect of the Charter. Um, and I'm, I'm quoting a little bit from memory, and I'm happy mm -hmm. to we can submit further information if I get this slightly wrong. But as I understand it, the, the Act says that the effect of the Charter is that it can be taken into consideration by tribunals and the uh, um, courts when considering cases in relation to Scottish Social Security, but the cases cannot be um, sort of triggered on the basis of a breach of the Charter itself, if that makes sense. So the Charter could be relevant to legal proceedings that arise in relation to Scottish Social Security, but couldn't be the basis um, so of those actions. a breach wouldn't lead to a... a no, um, but I think the, the points the Cabinet Secretary made in that regard are, are quite important in that mm. there is quite a significant um, political accountability for delivery of the Charter. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one other point that I would make is that the Scottish Commission, when it considers the extent to which the government has met the commitments in the Charter, um, it has a legal duty to do that through the lens of the international human rights framework, mm -hmm. which brings into, um, into play um, various sort of um, UN treaties and frameworks that they would have to consider. So um, that adds another sort of dimension of legality to the Scots' scrutiny. Um, of the Charter. And then just maybe one last point is that um, we now have Professor Alan Miller's report um, on taking forward a human rights-based approach across mm -hmm. Scottish Government generally. One of the recommendations in that report is obviously a, a Scottish human rights bill, mm -hmm. um, and that will have implications for all areas of Scottish Government policy, and not least Social Security. OK, thank you. OK, that was very helpful. Lots of us were not on the, the committee when, when, when the, the bill was, was being scrutinised. Our Deputy Convener was, who was nodding her head uh, as Mr O'Neill was, was talking. Uh, that was my understanding, having not been on the committee at that stage. If you think there's need for any further clarification, then Mr O'Neill or Cabinet Secretary, please do write to us. But that, that was my understanding of where, where the Charter sat within the, the, the legal process, if, if, if you like. Uh, New line of questioning, Shona Robinson, MSP. It's just really a, 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 a small point. Um, the Charter seem so far anyway to have been quite successful in the, the process of development of it and the the, um, the genuine engagement with, with people and their reflections on, on the Charter. I just wonder therefore if there's um, a, a possibility uh, of it becoming a bit of a template for other public services. I know that some public services already have their own kind of version I suppose of, of a Charter but the way this has been done, 
Are there lessons there for other public services, do you think? I think there's certainly a great interest within Scottish Government um, about the policy making process. This has been very different, so it's been very different for the ministers who have been responsible for it, as well as the officials who have been um, taking it through. But certainly it's one which has its clear advantages to that. So there is interest from other areas of government. Uh, there's also um, an enormous interest internationally in, in what we're doing as, as well. And um, officials have had correspondence um, from leading academics um, in a number of countries to actually investigate what we are doing um, to see whether there are lessons learned for how they also do policy making. So I actually think it goes much further than just looking at what we can do within the Scottish Government, and we are definitely doing that. Uh, but also I think it's um, exceptionally pleasing to see that um, other governments um, and academics are looking to what Scotland's done to see what they can learn from that. Any follow-up questions on that, Shura? No, that's fine. Okay. I, mean, I think it's a really interesting point. We've got um, Alok Sharma, MP, yeah. mm -hmm. um, UK Minister, coming uh, to our committee in a few weeks' time in relation to areas un under his responsibility. So that would be a fascinating discussion we can have in relation to lessons that can be learned for other public agencies, not just in Scotland, but across, uh, across the nations and regions of the UK in terms of charters and expectations. They're really interesting line of questions. Are, are there any more questions before we move to the next agenda item? Keith Brown. Okay, on that last point, and um, Mr O'Neill's previous account of the different political and legal accountabilities that lie within the Charter, which I think was really interesting, and also the Cabinet Secretary's point that other organisations are looking at this. Does the current DWP Charter share any of those elements of accountability? Um, and if it doesn't, do you know if they're looking at trying to amend what they've done, uh, given the experience of the Scottish Charter? I think it's a very different charter um, up here. We're obviously um, trying to do things very differently to the DWP, so there will be areas that this, this does not fit with um, the, the DWP's um, policy intention. For example, um, uh, you know, um, colleagues could point out many areas where that doesn't fit. Um, we have, um, obviously, at official level and ministerial level, uh, regular um, a contact with DWP officials and I've certainly said um, to uh, the new Secretary of State since she came into post that we are very happy to, to, um, to make available our experiences um, whether it's on the Charter or for example around the flexibility that we have in Scotland around Scottish Choices for Universal Credit um, and um, and you know whether it's DWP or other areas, we are of course happy to share our experiences in that and our lessons learned on this. But it doesn't currently share those accountabilities that have been described in the Scottish Charter. Is that, is that right? No. I think that that's pretty relevant in, in nations and regions sharing best practice. Um, but a little bit of mission drift, so we might end the questions at that point. So we will now move to, uh, uh, thank you for, for your evidence, we will now move to agenda item four, which is still uh, the draft social security charter, uh, and can invite Ms Somerville to move motion S5M15598, please. Formally moved, convener. Okay. So the question is uh, that S5M15598, uh, that the social security committee recommends that the Scottish social security charter and draft forum be approved. Are we content to approve that? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, can I thank yourself, Cabinet Secretary, and your officials for coming along here this morning? And uh, oh, clearly, we'll keep a watching brief on how the Charter gets implemented. But I think to all those people who helped draft and form uh, the wording and the ethos and culture within that charter. I think it's only right that we put on record our thanks to everyone here this morning as well. Uh, so thank you to you and your fish officials this morning. And we now move to agenda item, item five, future work, which we've agreed to take in private. So we now move into private session.